Meanwhile, back at the academy, the rest of the gang are enjoying a cozy afternoon of free time. And for one day only, the entire cast has decided to shed their ridiculous fantasy attires and anime school uniforms and dress like normal human beings. Anachronism aside, these are far superior designs. The fast rule of thumb in outfit design is to dress the characters in a way that is comfortable and natural for them. And everyone does look far more organic this way. Ignore the ridiculous go fur and skittles colors. These should be the default designs. Continuing the epic breakup storyline from episode 9, Rosemary tries to make peace with Sage in her own carefree way by pretending like the whole thing never happened. So, how are those pages, Sages? Gonna call you that from now on. Sage the Page Mage. <laughs> Mandatory Activity Girl was your name for me last week, Rose Barb. I thought we were past all that. Uh-huh. You thought? At this point, Rosemary should just let Sage be. If she wants to be a spiteful, holier-than-thou little bitch, then let her. You are honestly better off without this walking, talking collection of personality disorders. There is nothing either of you said or did that justifies this kind of bad blood continuing for several days. Just say you are sorry, hug, and be done with it. Especially since you have far greater troubles to worry about. Like the end of the world, your school crawling with spies, allegedly, and the fact that time and parsley have mysteriously disappeared. But none of these things are brought up. The show has returned back to the pointless filler content, even though this is the point where the narrative should have reached maximum velocity, until the finale, two episodes away. I could not care less about these two patching things up. I dislike them both, their relationship is lame, when it's not outright toxic, there is absolutely no reason for me to root for them, this subplot has no potential to be anything meaningful. It's gonna be a mutual, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. There's no perspective, nothing to chew, nothing lost, nothing gained. It's a minor glitch in the status quo, forced drama, overblown to an embarrassing degree. So just get it over with. In fact, if the writers wish to do something actually daring, break the mold, Evolve from this after-school special nonsense instead of getting hung up on the past and making up with a shitty friend just because, ditching this kind of toxic relationship would be an actually helpful narrative to explore. Not every story needs to have a happy ending in the traditional sense, but this is the story for the day, so we are shit out of luck. Aside from Rosemary feeling lonesome without her trusted ball and chain, Amaryllis has similar woes as well. Are Sage and Snapdragon just hanging out now? Is that a thing? Yup, that's what's happening. Gross, right? Yeah, it's a thing. Just like it was a thing at the end of the previous episode. Why are you talking about it like it's some kind of news? Instead of framing it like this, as a question, the dialogue should be, ever since the festival, those two have been inseparable. You know, equally obvious and useless, without giving each character Alzheimer's in the process. It's implied that Amaryllis and Snap have suffered a falling out as well, because... Why exactly? Please. What? Say please. You always order me around, but you never say please. <laughs> Ow! That, that actually hurt. This game is super realistic. Maybe we win by destroying the frozen people. Come on, help me smash them. No, that's that's just wrong. Yes, sick twist. <laughs> I can't always do things on your terms, Rill. Maybe you think I like following you around like a puppy. Uh-uh. I'm my own person. Is that really what you think? Let's just finish this round. If we lose, we quit. 
Snapdragon is such a whiny self-righteous piece of shit. When exactly has Amaryllis ever ordered Snap around? Before this one instance when getting frustrated by the shitty VR game? Never. Fiction. You made it up. It's never shown on screen. The show has constantly painted these two as equal friends. Both of them poke at one another, tease each other, and just hang around the school aimlessly, looking for bumpkins to bully. Neither of them is oppressing the other to do as they like. Snap is an arse towards Rosemary and Parsley on his own, for no reason. And Amaryllis is an arse towards everyone, on her own, for no reason. They both suffer from boredom and inflated sense of importance, and so they take it out on anyone and everyone around them. And if anything, Amaryllis has been remarkably accommodating towards Snapdragon, when he actually is struggling with something deep down inside. She's being a good friend here. The fact that Snap decides to brush off his best friend and not share his woes is on him alone. But being the victim is Snap's entire personality, so that's his battle plan through life. Honestly, Snap and Sage deserve each other. Have fun one-upping each other on the hierarchy of victimhood. Once everyone else gets fed up with your shit and leaves you two alone. Anyway, the two spurned former best friends decide to team up to steal back what is rightfully theirs. Slime Boy and Parnell are also there, because the voice talent already got paid, so might as well put them to work. How'd you end up with no roommate? Please don't say murder. Nah, it was Zinnia. Couldn't hack it. Plus, my Goliath Bird Eater tarantula scared her or whatever. Whoa! Whoa! Fighting against killer Parasex, facing enormous golems, Laughing maniacally while dangling for dear life on the back of a dragon. A teensy spider inside a glass box gives you the heebie-jeebies. No one is anything. Everyone is everything. Every joke just exists, regardless of who is acting as the butt. Just a reminder, character-based comedy needs to actually be character-based. And following up on that... The character of Amaryllis is an absolute mess. She's a one-dimensional bully, targeting Sage because of her heritage. She's a vapid choke dispenser, because the voice actor slash self-insert writer thinks they are a comedic genius. She's a loyal trans ally, validating Snap every step of the way, never cracking even a single jab, because that's what bullies and assholes do when it comes to trans issues, except if they are Callum, and then there's the constant edgelord act, glorification of violence, killing animals as a joke, pointing what is essentially a firearm at someone's face for mildly offending her friend, and that's all just quirky and silly, instead of alarming, because that's how the writers have decided to portray Amaryllis, because women. Let's remember the rules. Violent men are evil. Violent women are empowered. Her conduct would actually be indistinguishable from a villain, if only the show decided to give her that moniker. For the record, I find cowardice and others very attractive. <laughs> She's honestly a dumpster of writing. Aside from being nice to snap, nothing about her is likable. She is loud, vain, rude, conceited, her sociopathic tendencies are excused, she never develops, her background is brought up and dismissed as a joke, she just exists to fill the screen with idiotic hijinks and insipid dialogue, the same as the rest of the cast. And despite never apologizing for anything, or changing her conduct, she just sort of becomes lukewarm mates with the main gang. She's supposed to be the sarcastic one of the group, more so than time is. And she actually suffers the same issue as the elf. Both of them are barely tolerable. The few times they call out the rest of the cast for being imbeciles. 
the handful of decent moments in the show are entirely predicated on the writers roasting their own characters, essentially doing my job for me. Imagine, sad sage, all her embarrassing memories of wearing dumb hats and being boring and stuff, I don't know. Other than that, Amaryllis is just a tool, a narrative device, a bully for Sage, someone to stand by Snap as he bitches and moans, and the catalyst for this fiasco. So Amaryllis' brilliant plan to break up Snap and Sage is to conjure up a memory spell, which manifests a astral projection of the target enacting their past, and embarrass the two with their most shameful memories. Once again, this is something that just exists. The applications of this spell would be limitless, interrogations and the like as an obvious example. There would be no way for spies to hide anywhere, never crosses anyone's mind, but fuck it, whimsy away! Also, Amaryllis bums around with books and candles and waxes about magical ingredient lizards or some bullshit, and then just whips out her Terrasphere wand to cast the spell anyway. What? Did no one proofread this? I know the answer is fuck no, but it amazes me every time just how scattershot each plotline is. Not a single event follows logically from the prior one. The spell backfires as Rosemary grows a spine, and decides not to invade the privacy of the person she allegedly cares most in the entire world. Points for that. Come to think of it, why did Amaryllis need Rosemary to be her partner in crime in the first place? Her plan was to use magic from the get-go. Rosemary isn't a mage. So the only reason to invite Rosemary along was so that she could fuck up everything at the last second? Because plot... Right. The memories spring to life and start running around the school. And considering their purpose... All of these flashes from the past are super weak sauce. <laughs> Sage, it's fashion! It's all kiddie stuff. That's not embarrassing. Kids are dumb. Who cares? Why would the spell even target those? Instead of something more recent? Or actually scandalous? The fact that none of the memories have anything to do with the struggles of teenage life is already suspect. If these are actually the most mortifying memories these characters have, then their lives are pretty great. The Bumpler Brigade hunt down the memories and trap them inside bottles. I honestly don't care anymore. Parnell, if you tell anyone I vertically face-planted because of how dreamy Leland is, I'll turn you into a lizard and keep you in a box in my room. Got it? <laughs> Threaten me with something that isn't one of my life goals. So the whole idea of Parnell is to be as cringy as humanly possible every time he opens his mouth? Is that it? Please, can we just let it end? Sage and I once lost a chameleon in a corn maze. And it was way easier to catch than memories. Reptiles are easy. <laughs> Snapdragon got me my first lizard, Bethany. Aww. Pet or potion ingredient? <sighs> Why would I name a potion ingredient? Because murder makes you tingle? And by the by, even this one defining somewhat substantive aspect of Amaryllis, her friendship with Snap, is built on shaky ground. When did the two actually meet? How did they become friends? This is Snapdragon's hometown. That doesn't exactly look like. It's basically made of money, castles everywhere, so many lights you can't even sleep at night. When have these two met? At what circumstances? They are clearly from two different worlds. If the show refuses to give an adequate explanation, then I refuse to care about this friendship. It's not constructed with any kind of organic story flow or vision. It's fake. It's hollow. The friendship just exists because that's what it says in the script. At least Rosemary and Sage have a reason to be mates. 
even though they have little in common, they grew up as neighbors, limited choices, so of course they hang around together. The relationship between any two characters is supposed to blossom naturally. Friends need to have a reason for their bond, what brought them together, and what binds them together. And that bond will naturally shatter when faced with irreconcilable differences, the natural flow of life, things changing for the better or worse. That's what makes relationships feel real, that's what makes the audience care. People getting hung up on minor spats and pretending like they are life-altering events is not appealing. Write what you know, sheltered souls create sheltered stories. And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for listening till the end. The continued support is very much appreciated. And a special thanks goes to all the supporters on Patreon, as well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaja Vanderwatt, and Six Stars. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.